Thank you, Kathy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, what a privilege it is to be able to enter into prayer with you. We're grateful for your grace, your initiating grace that makes it even possible to approach your throne. And we praise you for your holy and just and infinite and eternal and full of wisdom and truth and mercy. Come to you this morning not as perfect people, but as your children, adopted into your family, the church. And we come to you with hearts of gratitude for your blessings namely those that are found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we live in a day where there's, there's a glaring contrast between your precepts and where, where much of the world seems to be heading because they reject you. And we ask that in the times we're living in that you would move and work to protect and bring true life, not just to our land, but to this world. So that you'd raise up those in positions of influence who would stand in the gap between the the consequences of self-centeredness and craziness and, and the blessings that come with your righteousness. What a contrast. Lord, we ask that you would confound the foolishness of those who work against you and that you might bring about a heartfelt desire to know you. May the true church be salt and light in the darkness. I pray for those throughout the world especially for Pastor David and for men and for those church planners there and all the people that they're reaching and have reached. We pray that your gospel would continue to impact the world through them. Protect them, grant them strength and endurance and zeal for the gospel and may they stand clearly upon the pointed edge of that gospel and all that goes with it. Lord, we're grateful that the deck is never stacked against you or your people. And we're indeed grateful for the privilege of serving you. Lord, move in your church. Move throughout the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I've got a question. When was the last time you said something that was stupid? <laughs> You know, was it last week? Was it, was it last month? Or maybe you're asking yourself, you know, have I said something stupid yet today? I don't know. You know, but sometimes we do that. Sometimes the verbal communication, which what makes up 7% of everything, might come out, but the 93% kind of throws it the other way. You know, I was at a party a few years ago. I'm, I've alluded to this some, but, 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 but at the party there were several, I guess you could say, relatively famous people, regionally famous in certain areas, they're famous, you might say. And then out of the blue, I asked my son to introduce me to one of these famous people that he knew that was a friend of his. So he took me over to the table, introduced me, and we, we shook hands. Nice to meet you. And then there was silence, awkward silence. I, haven't, I hadn't planned my next move, so I had to think of something quick. So I said, thank you for being my son's friend. I meant it to be tongue-in-cheek, but it came out just like that. And I mean, my son rolls his eyes. And then the rest of the time was awkward silence. You know, thank you for being my son's friend, you famous person, you. Well, this morning we're going to look at a friendship. And it's a friendship that you have. And it's with a very prominent person. It's a friendship that this person initiated in a very grand, spectacular way. And we hear him in this passage. He's saying things like, you are my friends, but I've called you friends. Of course, you know that I'm talking about this friend. His name is Jesus Christ. And we've been in this. We're going to be here probably for another month or so to get through the Gospel of John. More than you want to know. But there's so much good stuff in here. And the evening that we've been talking about for the last month and a half begins in that upper room. Jude, Judas is there and he leaves early and Jesus is there. Onlookers are there. The disciples are there and they're troubled. And, and after their chat at the table in the upper room, they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane and they're passing through Jerusalem and the temple courts. And he's encouraging them. He's saying things like, guys, I'm going away, but that's a good thing that you'll do the works that I do still, and you'll even do greater works because of the fact that I'm going away. And then not only that, but I'll send you a helper. And now he tells them, and this is, they're almost to the garden. 
He's almost done talking. He's encouraging them by telling them, you are my friends. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing, isn't it? So there's two points in this passage that we want to look at today. The first one is this. What is it that makes it possible that any person could ever be called a friend by Jesus Christ? That's a phenomenal thing. What makes it happen? And then secondly, what does a friend of Jesus look like? So that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to point to. Now the first thing, how is it that a person can be called a friend of Jesus? And the answer is simple. You see it in your passage. Jesus is the one that makes us his friend. He's the one that declares it. He's the one that initiates it. Now, if your Bibles are open, and I'd encourage you to do that, if you look at verses 12 through 14, it kind of sounds like you have to earn Jesus' friendship. It says, you are my friends if, there's a condition, if you do what I command. That's what that verse seems to say. And what's the command? The command is to love each other as I have loved you. In fact, earlier he said, if you do keep my commands, then you will remain in my love. So we say, okay, I understand that. But then he says what it looks like. He says, love each other to the point where you lay down, you are willing to lay down your life for your friends. So I look at this. And it seems to be saying, so if you, want to call G- if you want Jesus to call you a friend, then all you have to do is be willing to lay down your life for all your friends and obey all of his commands. And that little word, if, sounds like the burden of Jesus calling me a friend, that that burden is on me. If I do this, then he will be my friend. If I love sacrificially, if I love and obey all the time, then I will earn Jesus' friendship. But let's look again. Is that what it's saying? And I know what you're thinking. Or you will soon be thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute. It seems to me, when I think about this, that the, the, the greatest love you can show as great, as, as great a love as is dying for a friend or a spouse or someone you love, dying for someone who is a good person or is, is a righteous dude, that's a wonderful love. But it seems like a greater love than dying for a friend would be to die for a stranger or to die for an enemy. That seems to be, this is what you're thinking now, that's what seems to be to me that that's a greater, more sacrificial love, dying for an enemy. But he says the greatest love that, that, that you could do is to die for a friend. Now, something's missing here. What is it? And in verse 12, we begin to see the answer to that. He says, love each other as I have loved you. As I have loved you. That's the key here. He said, I have laid down my life in order to call you my friends. And that sentence, what it's doing is it's telling what his love looks like for his friends, what it looks like for us. How did he love us? He gave his life for us. He gave his life for our sin. He gave his life for our inability. He rescued us. He took, his pl- took our place. He exchanged his life for our lives. When we were his enemies, Romans 5 says this, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Jesus didn't die for friends. Jesus died for enemies, his enemies. And because of his great love, his sacrificial love, those enemies for whom he died are now called his friends. So maybe these verses are not so much talking about meeting a condition in order to be called a friend of Jesus, but that Jesus met that condition for us by loving us to the point of laying down his life in order to call us his friends. You see that? We, those who were once his enemies, are now his friends. That's a big deal. So then, 
we don't love and obey in order to become a friend of Jesus. We love and obey because we already are a friend of Jesus. Those who once were his enemies were now his friends. In fact, 1 John, John the gospel writer also wrote 1 John, says we love because he first loved us. He calls us friends. And what a huge, cherished friendship that is. To read these chapters, you find that Jesus' love for his friends is actually equal to the love that God the Father has for his son. If you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for you, you're his friend. And you're enmeshed in that love that God the Father has for God the Son in a very, very, very wonderful, unique way. And you know what that's called? That's called grace. That's called abounding grace. We love, we obey because he initiated, he loved. He gave his life for us before we were ever born. That's a good love. How encouraging. We're his friend. He is our friend. How vital is his friendship to you? How vital is it in your emotions, in your life, in your activities? In your heart, listen to this. John Piper, this is a quote from Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love. He says this, the critical question for our generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends that you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied in heaven if Christ was not there? Our friendship is important to Jesus. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. His love is without limits. He gave his life as an act of divine friendship to all who respond to this offer of salvation. That's what John 3.16 is talking about. And friendships are important. Friendships matter, don't they? Friendships matter. We're made to be friends. It matters in a church. Friendship is a sign of a healthy church. I mean, you can have a lot of great programs in church. But if people aren't connecting relationally through them, then they just become like spinning plates. Let's go spin this plate. Let's go spin that plate. We're friends with Jesus. Why? Because of the extent of his love for us. What a wonderful thing. So what does that look like in this passage? Where, what can we glean? What does a friendship with Jesus look like? What insight does he give us here for, for abiding in and maintaining that friendship in a way that bears fruit? And he gives us, okay, he gives us some fundamentals. Let's think about fundamentals for a minute. They're vital. Every part of life, for the most part, I haven't thought about every part of life, but of the, every part that I've thought about, has fundamentals. Every sport, every game, art, investing, inventing, engineering, even driving down to Soto, there's some fundamentals that we need to stick with. Basic, repeatable principles and activities that help us to be successful. Now let me explain it this way, okay? This is, might be a little, a little cheesy, but I think you'll get the point. Sports, most sports, from bowling to bike riding, from baseball pitching to field goal kicking, from tennis to pickleball, from snow skiing to golf even. See our fundamentals. Take golf. You ever, you ever play golf? You know, some of us do. Now, I learned early on that there's three basic fundamentals to golf, and you'll find it's true in most sports as well. PGA. You ready for this? Posture, grip, and alignment. PGA. Fundamentals. The posture is how you stand. Are you too tall? Are you too rigid? Are you squatting too much? Are you bending the right way? There's a certain way you need to stand. It's called the posture. Grip. Your grip affects how you swing. There's your stroke, if it's wrong or too loose or too tight. And it has an impact on your success. And the third, the A stands for alignment. Where the ball is in relation to your feet and where you're pointing. And I can tell you that most of the people who play hole number six at Balboa are pointing right to our yard. And I've got about 250 golf balls to prove that. 
It's a fact, 253 counting yesterday. I mean, I can sit on my back patio and I go, okay, I see where that, that guy's going to hit a big high cut over that ditch right in my yard and I'll run out there. And I know what you're thinking. Again, you're saying, what does it in the world does this have to do with being a fruit-bearing friend of Jesus? Well, here we go. It's in this passage. You ready? Fundamental number one, posture. The posture of prayer. Verse 7. Ask what you wish and it shall be done for you. That's the posture of prayer. It's not just words you speak and go on to the next thing. There's a posture, an abiding posture to prayer. There's power in praying in Jesus' name. It's important. The verb pray is mentioned 121 times in the Bible. When it's used as a noun, it's a little bit over 100 more times. We pray about things. It says pray without ceasing. Devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. And Jesus has already told them back in chapter 14. He says, ask anything in my name and I will do it. That's abiding prayer he's talking about. Remaining prayer, asking, seeking, waiting. In fact, once they got to the garden, the first thing Jesus did was kneel down and pray. James 5.16 says, the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much, availeth much. I was thinking about that. You know, in Romans 4, Abraham is mentioned as an example of a righteous man. And in the Old Testament, Abraham was called a friend of God. The effective prayer of a righteous man is veileth much because a righteous man is a friend of Jesus. So then the question is, what is prayer to you? Do you have a prayer life? If abiding means being at home with Jesus. This whole chapter is about abiding, remaining, staying put, being at home with Jesus. And if abiding means being at home with Jesus, then we should be at home with prayer. So that first fundamental, the P, is the posture of prayer. What about the second one? A firm, proper grip on the Word of God. Verse also says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. Or your translation say, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Here's the question. How much of your thought life contains his words? You know, you ever, you ever go through a time where, or we all do, where, where, where we don't seem to be growing spiritually like we like? You ever go through a time where you find that you don't have that much of a desire to grow closer to the Lord? We all do. And I think the question, the first question we need to ask is, are we spending time in the word? Is the word spending time in us? And people will say, yeah, but I don't understand it. It's too many questions or it's it's too confusing. Whatever the reason, if your Christian life ever seems like you're on a roller coaster or if you're just stuck somewhere in the same place on the track, or if you, you find that there's a lack of fruit or even a lack of desire for the things of God, let me encourage you to develop a hunger and a satisfaction for a steady diet of the Word of God. Pray for God to give you that and then act on it. Start with John's Gospel. Open the Word. You don't have to read chapters and chapters and chapters. Just read a couple of paragraphs and let it have its abiding effect upon you. The second fundamental grip on the word. I would encourage you on a one to ten scale, ask yourself this question. How great is my desire that the words of Jesus are actively abiding in me? And if you're not satisfied with your answer, take it to God and begin reading his word. That's an important fundamental, the word of God. The posture of prayer, a grip on his word. And then what's the third fundamental? The A, align yourself in his direction. Align yourself with his purpose and plans. Align yourself with the love of God. Verse 9, verse 14 talks about that. The love of God the Father. Align yourself with his desires. You see, when he says, when he talks to his friends and he tells them to obey his commands, the command, you know, I'm in the army now. But those commands are nothing more than his desires couched in his love for us. 
like a perfect parent. Doing what he asks. That we love one another. That's what he asks. That's evidence of our friendship with Jesus. And we love each other. Why? Because we love him. And that takes work. And that takes forgiveness. And that takes forbearance. And that takes energy. And that takes sacrifice. And when we do this, when we align ourselves with the love of God, in this passage, we see three things that are going to happen. In verse 10, loving each other is evidence of remaining in the love of God. Loving one another is the fruit of being in the love of God. It's like the grapes on the vine. Verse 11, that my joy may be made full and that my joy may be in you. Loving each other leads to joy. And then in verse 14, loving each other proves our friendship with Jesus. It's the fruit of our friendship. You know, there's a great comfort in being a friend of Jesus. We live in a world that's consumed by the temporal. Economics are the haves getting power and trying to keep power in a country or in a situation where They try to seduce the have-nots into believing their way is best or ideologies or wars or body-altering, temporal, feelings and emotions. They're all temporal, but a friendship with Jesus that's maintained with the posture of prayer and a grip on the word and aligning ourselves with the love of the Father. Those are not temporal. Those are eternal things. And all this other stuff, it'll it'll, it'll pass and, and it'll perish just like the Tower of Babel. But a friendship with Jesus lasts forever. We take it with us wherever we go for eternity. See, we have a different home. Being at home with Jesus, being a friend of Jesus, we have an eternal home. That friendship lasts forever. Abide and remain and stay put. Jesus is our friend. Jesus makes himself at home with us. He's the vine. We're the branches. We're loved by God our Father like our Father loves His Son, Jesus Christ. So let my encouragement is, let's take that friendship with Jesus wherever we go. We'll carry it to heaven. Friendship with Jesus, that's, that's, that's a really good thing. A really good thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that, for your initiating grace that before eternity began, somewhere in the counsels of your mind and your purpose and your providence, you saw fit to send your son to go to the cross. And he calls his disciples friends. And he died. And by believing in him, we might become his friend as well. Father, move us in a way that we really enjoy the benefit of being that friend of Jesus, that friendship, that eternal.